Hey guys, I was just up at Grand Teton National Park where I was working with the Nikon Z9 and the 600 F4 to see if I could photograph some elk. I also brought along some of my sound equipment to try to capture elk bugling at the same time. I'll show you what I was able to capture and how I dealt with the low light of early morning and late afternoon. I'll go over how I set up the Z9 for focusing in the low light of very early mornings, and I'll also show you my panning technique to keep you shooting even in the lowest light conditions. Let's get started. Hi, I'm Terry Vanderheiden, full-time professional photographer. Grand Teton National Park offers many photographic opportunities, but also has a few challenges when it comes to photographing wildlife. And today, we're concentrating on photographing the elk. While they're plentiful in the park, they kind of are skittish and not simple to get photographs of as because they kind of tend to shy away from humans, even while in the park. And this is because Grand Teton is one of the few national parks to allow elk hunting inside the park. Beginning early November, the elk will be much harder to find as the hunting permits start to go into effect. In early October, there are some herds that are unsettled with the remnants of the effects of the rut. The rut, also known as the mating season, generally happens in the Grand Teton Park the last couple of weeks of September and the first couple of weeks into October. The elk that normally inhabit the higher country for the bulk of the year will make their way down in the flatlands near Jackson and take up residence in the valleys and the meadows to find more food, warmer weather, and they're also looking for a mate. The timing of this rut is a bonus for us photographers. Since the elk are in the flatlands in the autumn, our backgrounds can be more colorful with the yellowing aspen trees to give a really nice pop to our photographs. And since it's mating season, the elk are much more distracted with each other than worrying about photographer trying to take their picture. On this trip, I was working with the Z9 and the 600 millimeter F4. I was also using the FTZ2 adapter to adapt the 600 to my Z9. I have this rig on a Wimberly gimbal head mounted on a set of really right stuff tripod legs. Once the Z9 is attached to the lens, the lens operates as normal. Should I want to use a teleconverter, I just attach it between the lens and the FTZ adapter. Now, since I'm talking about them, I have an opinion on teleconverters. While I own one, I seldom use it anymore. When I was shooting the DSLR and, and shooting the D5, the sensor was smaller than the Z9. Since it didn't have the extra resolution, enlarging it in post would yield a little less sharpness in that final image. That's when I would opt to get the teleconverter out, and I would try to get that extra additional magnification through the lens. With the D5, I'd add the teleconverter to get that extra length, and the lens was shooting at approximately 840 millimeters. Now that I'm shooting with the Z9, I have about 47 megapixels as compared to the 21 megapixels of the D5. Because using a teleconverter comes at a cost, both in quality and in light. When you're using a teleconverter, not only is the image not quite as sharp as with the prime lens you have it attached to, but it also, you end up losing a full stop of light. If you're trying to capture wildlife, for the most part, you work in the early morning and late in the evening not a time of day where you can spare a full stop of light. If you consider the length of the lens at 600 millimeters, your general rule of shutter speed should be at least double that, just for the magnification. That puts you at 1 1250th of a second. That's also assuming your subject isn't moving around too much. If you have an active subject, then that shutter speed should be higher. If I added a teleconverter to the rig, I'd go from 1 1250th of a second down to 1 640th of a second and that's not even double for my magnification. That kind of change would definitely endanger the possibility of getting that razor sharp image. My other option is to increase the ISO, which with the Z9 is very good, but it doesn't take long to introduce a lot of noise into the image that will also reduce your sharpness. Early in the morning, you might already be shooting at ISO 6400. So to move your ISO to compensate one full stop of light, used by that teleconverter would put you at 12,800 ISO. 
And that's just too high for my taste. For me, I'd rather enlarge the photograph through cropping in Lightroom to the desired crop rather than using the 1.4 converter and losing that one stop of light. I don't want to give up sharpness to too high of an ISO and I certainly don't want to shoot at a shutter speed that makes my images look soft. That's because I'm always looking for that razor sharp image. If you're looking to create more razor sharp images yourself, check out my ebook, Razor Sharp Nature Photography, available on my website at imagelight.com. This ebook takes you through all the steps of getting razor sharp images from simple aperture selection to what shutter speed to use with long telephoto lenses like when you're out photographing elk. I have a whole chapter devoted to post sharpening software, how to buy a good tripod, and a step-by-step -step on focus stacking and many other professional keys to getting razor sharp images. Go to the digital products section of my website, imagelight.com and get your copy today. Read it instantly on your iPad or your computer. I'll leave a link below in the info box if you wanna go check it out. I'd also like to thank all the photographers who have already bought and downloaded my ebook, Razor Sharp Nature Photography. I really appreciate you supporting the creation of these videos and my podcast, The Nature Photography Podcast, by purchasing these products. Thanks again. When setting up the Z9 for wildlife photography, I usually use 3D tracking with animal detection for my autofocus. Well, this focus tracking works pretty well when there's plenty of light. In the early, early morning, I switched to a custom focus box to make focusing a little easier. And I'll show you how I set that up. When you go into the AF area mode, scroll down to wide AF C1. There's a toggle to the right that brings you to a screen that allows you to build your own focus box. For this one, I moved the toggle selector to build the horizontal box to nine and the vertical dimension to three for a nine by three box. This is all done by the selector disc around the OK button. Once you like the size of the box, hit the center OK button. Now I'm shooting with animal detection and the C1 AF box I just created. I created the size of the box while I was photographing the elk. This box kind of approximated the size of the elk on the screen, and that's why I went with that dimension but you can build your customized box any size you want. And it's really quick, so it doesn't take you that long to put one together out in the field. I always use back button focus on continuous autofocus. As I'm shooting, I just hold the back button down to follow the elk out in the field. If the light's right, the animal detection will sometimes grab onto the eye of the elk, which is great. But I know with eye detection that the camera is searching for a pattern to grab onto. And in the case of the elk, there's a brown eye set against brown fur, so not much of a pattern for the camera to look for. I found that keeping the AF area modes in my quick My Menu, I can access it and change it pretty quickly when I'm out in the field. If you're enjoying this content, please hit the like button and then hit subscribe and remember to ring the bell to be notified of my next video. Soon, YouTube will be shareable via what they call handles. My handle will be at TV510. That should be easier to remember and to direct others to my channel than remembering my whole last name, Vanderheiden. Heck, that took me until third grade to figure out how to spell that myself. You can also find me on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, all at TV510. So to find elk, I spent the early morning hours driving around with the windows down, listening. I was looking for the distinctive sound and kind of an eerie sound of that bull elk bugling. While it was kind of cold with the windows down, I was able to quite often find them by sound first, and then I'd make my way over to a spot to view them. This bugling is their mating call. It's used in two ways. One is to entice the female into mating. Apparently, this can be a big turn on for a cow elk hanging out in the nearby field. The other way this bugling is used is to answer other male elk who are eyeballing the same females kind of like a challenge call. If you're in the right place, you can hear back and forth of an elk bugling to back and forth to one another and then answering back. Here's a sample. You may want to put on your headphones for this, but take a listen.
I'm using some stereo microphones in a wind protection system to capture these sounds. In some cases, I'm also using a parabolic microphone for more direct capture of the sounds. If you'd like to hear more about how my sound setup works, leave me a message in the comment section and I'll try to make a video about how I record nature sounds. The typical challenges for a bull elk are one, trying to get the females in the harem to acquiesce. With plenty of bugling, he's always making his case. The other job he has is to keep the herd organized by constantly trying to round up the females if they stray too far away. In the case of the herd that I was watching for a couple of days, the dominant male was chasing off an older buck that was also bugling, as well as chasing a younger buck off that were both trying to make time with his females. No sooner than he'd run off one interloper, the herd would get scattered and he'd have to come back hustling around to get them all rounded up again. Here's another look at the dominant bull elk doing his best on this particular morning. When you're challenged with shutter speed versus high ISO dilemma that we all face when shooting wildlife, sometimes it's better to take what the scene is offering you than trying to force it. In the case of the bull elk that's always on the move chasing the competition out or rounding up a stray female, the light was pretty low in this case. I was shooting at wide open F4 at ISO 6400. Rather than go any higher on the ISO, I decided to make panning exposures. This is where you can lower the shutter speed quite a bit, and with the help of a good tripod head, you can follow the horizontal movement and blur the background. In this situation, I was also able to lower my ISO all the way down to 1000. I was shooting this running elk at 1 1 25th of a second and panning with the animal. As long as the elk stayed on the same plane, parallel with the sensor of my camera, and I had the movement of the tripod head at the correct speed, I was able to make some pretty neat motion captures. To start, I set up my tripod with the help of a leveling head. I was able to get the Wimberly head perfectly level. Next, I locked down the tilt of the tripod so that the head would only go left and right on a horizontal plane. I set my Z9 on manual at F4, the widest opening of this lens, and then the shutter speed to 1 1 25th of a second. I then set the ISO to give me that decent exposure. I guess that with an elk running, 125th would be a good starting point to capture the movement of the background while keeping the subject sharp. Now you can alter this to fit your liking. The slower shutter speed, the more background blur you're gonna get and the less chance of the subject being sharp. So it's a bit of a trade-off. This is a fun way to shoot, especially if you don't have the daylight to do anything else. Really early in the morning, sometimes there's just not enough light. I'll warn you that this technique does take some practice and the number of acceptable images is quite low. I was getting about 10 reasonably sharp images for every 100 images I shot. From those, I had to pare those down to find the ones where the legs of the animal looked decent and the composition I was looking for was good. So out of every 100 images, I ended up with two or three that I liked enough that I'd share. I encourage you to try this technique of panning for your wildlife. It can make the difference when you're shooting in low light and you don't want to shoot at those extremely high ISOs. That's it for this week. This is Terry Vanderheiden. See you next time.